Okay, good evening everybody. My name is James Harvey and as Pete said, I'm a commercial archaeologist who works for ULAS. Back in October 2002, ULAS offered me an opportunity to work at the recently discovered Saw's Wedding Closure at Husband's Bosworth. Back then I didn't envisage that 18 years later I'd be writing the site up or that I'd be talking to you about it over a Zoom meeting. Firstly, I want to apologise now for some of the imagery. Uh, most of the work was undertaken before digital cameras were commonplace on excavations, so most of the photos have been converted from slides. Also, the post-excavation analysis is still ongoing. Uh, we are waiting on radiocarbon dates to assess for the phasing of some of the more important elements of the site. Uh, these are likely to have a significant bearing on our interpretations. Okay. Okay. So where is Husband's Bosworth? Husband's Bosworth is a large village in South Leicestershire, uh, located about 20 kilometres south of Leicester. It's marked by the red dot, if I can turn on my marquee pen. Uh, there we are. Yep. Uh, it's marked by the red dot at the crossroads between the road to Leicester and Northampton and the road between Market Harbour and Lutterworth. Back in 1996, land to the south of the village at Wheeler Lodge Farm was identified for the proposed extension to Husband's Bosworth Quarry. As you can see from this plan, the shaded area marks the location of the proposed extension on the western side of Welford Road. Uh, it's situated on a spur of higher ground overlooking the River Avon, which marks the boundary between Leicestershire and Northamptonshire. Uh, the archaeology survey team from Leicestershire County Council Museums carried out field walking across much of the proposed extension in 1996. They identified a dense flint scatter containing diagnostic pieces spanning Mesolithic to the early Bronze Age periods. Uh, if you look at the distribution plan, you can see a fairly wide array of tools as well as large quantities of mapping waste. There appears to be clear clustering of material on the higher areas of the site dropping away to where the ground falls away to the, the southwest. Although flint was recovered across much of the area, uh, the most significant zone was located between three and four. You can see here um, there's a significant number of flint scrapers uh, marked with a circle uh, were recovered by the field walking. Uh, this is indicative of concentrated occupational activity. As nothing was previously known about the site, such as any crop marks, it was recommended that geophysical survey was undertaken across all of the site. Uh, this was an important decision back then as a rare, it's very rare for flint scatters to ever correlate with below ground features. Uh, so in 1998, ULAS was commissioned to undertake an initial survey across part of the flint scatter located against the southwest of the um, field four boundary in this area here. Okay. So here's the results of that initial survey. Uh, as you can see, it clearly shows part of two parallel curving interrupted ditches correlating with the flint scatter. Subsequent surveys since revealed much of the monument. It consists of an oval enclosure formed by two roughly circular or oval concentric lines of interrupted ditches. It measures roughly 180 by 150 metres and covers an area of 1.5 hectares. The distance between the inner and outer ditches is between 9 and 11 metres. It's formed closely comparable to Neolithic Causeway enclosures that have been recorded across the British Isles and Western Europe. These monuments are distinctly early Neolithic, with recent redating work suggesting the earliest enclosures date to around 3700 BC. The work has also suggested that many were constructed over a relatively short period of time, indicating a rapid transition of ideas from mainland Europe. In, in 1998, three trenches were excavated across the northern and western sides of the enclosure. Numerous ditch features correlating with the geophysical anomalies were identified with all the trenches. As you can see, Trench 1 extended southwards in order to locate the ditch terminal, one of the segmented ditches just down through here. Uh, this segment measured more than nine metres long and up to three metres wide. Uh, the southern terminal was excavated, uh, is excavated just to a depth of 1.2 metres, which is the safe level you can go to in a trench. As you can see from the profile, the ditch is likely to have gone down maybe two metres or more. Various possible recuts were recorded in the ditch profile, although the narrow scope of the work limits any clear understa understanding of the phasing of the, of the uh, segment. A small quantity of pottery and flint was recovered from the excavated slot, 
with diagnostic pieces only coming from the upper layers. These included Middle Neolithic Peterborough Ware pottery, a Late Neolithic arrowhead and a thumbnail scraper. Although these finds indicate the enclosure was still at least partially open during the early Bronze Age, they indicate no idea when the monument was actually constructed. Several other features were recorded within the trenches, including a possible line of post holes located parallel to the eastern side of the ditch that may have been internal, related to the internal bank. However, very little was excavated in order to interpret the actual nature of these features. With the evaluation confirming the results of the geophysical survey, the area was withdrawn from the proposed core extension. It was subsequently scheduled in 2001 and due to its national importance and no further work has been undertaken since. Of course, when enclosure at Husband's Bosworth adds to a list of over 80 known examples across Britain, most of the ident identified from aerial photography. However, relatively few have been ex in extensively excavated. From the distribution map, you can see that they predominantly spread across southern Britain. Husband's Bosworth positioned on the northwestern edge of this clustering. Uh, the nearest examples to Husband Bosworth are Dallington and Briar Hill in Northamptonshire, which are positioned on the opposite sides of the Nen Valley. The vast majority of Causeway enclosures are oval in plan. Some are a single concentric circuits, while others have up to three concentric ditches. It has been suggested that when double ditches run parallel, such as at Husband's Bosworth, that the upcast may have been combined to form a central bank, creating a more formalised entrance into the interior of the enclosure. Most circuits enclose an area between 0.5 and 3 hectares, so Husband's Bosworth sits nicely in the middle of these ranges. Most causeway enclosures are located on higher ground, a distinctive characteristic as they're often sited adjacently to the actual summit, so they have a distinct orientation. And this is certainly the case at Husband Bosworth, where the enclosure is tilted southwestwards towards the River Avon. Briar Hill, located 25 kilometres south of Husband Bosworth, represents the only excavated example in the East Midlands. Looking at the two plans of Briar Hill and Husband Bosworth, they do appear to be remarkably similar in form. However, a Briar Hill also contains an inner circuit, which is presumed to be a later addition. Further enclosure at Husband's Bosworth cannot be entirely ruled out, as much of the internal area was not covered by the geophysical survey. Ready carbon dating uh, from Briar Hill suggests the monument was probably constructed somewhere between 3750 and 3400 BC, with the associated ditches repeatedly recut over a period of 150 to 500 years. Evidence for contemporary act activity actually inside the enclosure was sparse, with most of the excavated features dating to the later ne Neolithic or later periods. The lack of associated activity within the enclosure is entirely typical of most excavated examples, which often only contain a sparse scatter of pits and post holes. So what was happening during the early Middle Neolithic period in these sites? In the past, interpretations regarding the function of cause when enclosures have oscillated between ceremonial centres and settlement. However, it is now generally agreed that these sites were not permanently occupied. Most modern investigations have supported early interpretations. They, are, they can be compared to fairgrounds, places where dispersed social groups could come together at certain times to reaffirm their sense of community for a range of activities, including feasting, crafts and the performance of rituals. In this case, in this sense, Husband's Bosworth presumably served as a place of meeting and ceremonies for the early farming communities living in the surrounding Avon, Swift and Welland Valleys. Although the Causeway enclosure was saved from the quarrying, areas to the north, south and west of the monument were granted planning permission and gravel extraction commenced in 2000. This offered a rare opportunity to investigate the immediate environs outside of Causeway enclosure. This archaeological investigation mainly comprised of a watching brief during the quarry works, but also included further phases of geophysical survey, evaluation and preemptive excavations. Okay, just looking back at the geophysical survey again, uh, a circular anomaly was identified against field, the Field 5 boundary, located about 60 metres southwest of the causeway enclosure. It was initially interpreted as a possible Bronze Age barrow and was subject to preemptive excavation in 2001. As you can see from the plan, 
The excavation revealed a penannular ring ditch measuring 24 metres by 22 metres. There were no traces of any banks or a mound. A blocked entrance was located on its northeastern side that was presumably represents a later addition to the monument. Numerous features were recorded in the enclosed space, but no evidence of a burial pit or traces of funeral activity was found. Most of the features were actually natural in origin and are likely to have predated the ring ditch. Various pits that were archaeological could not be directly related to the enclosure. And the enclosure itself was truncated by a later Iron Age roundhouse, meaning various periods of activity are likely to be represented in this area. Various sections were excavated across the perimeter of the ring ditch. They recorded a ditch measuring up to three metres wide and 1.7 metres deep. Although some erosion was evident around the top of the profile, it was generally steep with a flat base. The presumed northeast entrance measured five metres wide and was blocked by a pit that matched the curvature of the ditch and had been dug to a similar depth. This was presumably a later insertion, possibly preventing further access into the ring ditch. The sections do not give any clear evidence for a related bank or mound, however they did suggest the ring ditch had been deliberately backfilled. The whole ring ditch was reduced by a machine and much of its base was hand excavated. Occasional areas of burnt soil were recorded within the upper profile, which could indicate burning episodes were occurring inside the enclosure. Unfortunately, very little dating evidence was recovered from the base of the ditch. Several pieces of flint were present, but nothing particularly diagnostic. A couple of deposits did contain small quantities of hazelnut shells that have been sent for radiocarbon dating. The pottery recovered in very small quantities from the middle of the fields was all diagnostically Peterborough ware. It suggests the monument is likely to date to the middle of the Neolithic rather than being early Bronze Age. However, we are still awaiting confirmation of this. A clear spatial relationship exists between the ring ditch and the adjacent causeway and enclosure, which could signify a broadly contemporary date for the two monuments. As you can see, both its shape and or orientation broadly mirror that of the causeway and enclosure. Its entranceway directly faces the monument as well. Unfortunately, the surviving evidence has provided little indication of what function the ring ditch served. Presumably, these types of monuments performed a variety of functions that were subject to change over their lifespan. Moe have recently excavated a slightly larger Penania ring ditch at Kibworth, located 12 kilometres to the north. A pit had also been excavated in the entrance, partially cutting one of the ditch terminals. Parts of an articulated human burial were recorded within the base of the pit that had been radiocarbon dated to the Middle Neolithic. Disarticulated human remains were also recovered from the ditch itself, producing an overlapping date extending into the early Neolithic period. It's possible that similar remains could have been present at Husband's Bosworth, but they are unlikely to have survived the highly acidic soils that were present on the site. The stone structure was located out, immediately outside the entranceway of the ring ditch during later watching brief phase. It comprised of several phases of remodelling and although no human remains were recovered, various elements of its construction bore clear resemblance to other Neolithic mortuary structures excavated elsewhere, where less acidic soils have allowed the preservation of both articulated and disarticulated human remains. The earliest phase of the structure consisted of a large pit or possibly two intercutting pits, which is marked by the blue line. It measured over four metres long and 45 centimetres deep. Although the pit had been extensively truncated by later remodelling, a line of cobbles was noted along its northern side. Here, a thin, base, a thin deposit of distinct manganese staining was recorded, possibly representative of decayed organic matter, suggesting that stones may have originally framed a burial or mortuary deposit. The backfield pit was subsequently truncated by a large post hole at the western end. A very similar post hole was also located, located at the eastern end of the pit, suggesting a possible paired arrangement. Unfortunately, no diagnostic material or no pottery or flint that was diagnostic was re recovered from any of the associated deposits within these features, although small quantities of flint waste was recovered. The earliest phase of the structure is reminiscent of other early Neolithic linear mortuary structures where stones or timber planks have been used to frame burials and mortuary deposits, such as the structure excavated at Radley in uh, Oxfordshire. Along here you've got the stone framing and there's evidence that there was planking um, from uh, 
charcoal planking from uh, from a coffin or a chamber. The second phase of the structure is more akin to the paired stone arrangements, paired post arrangements seen in the framing mortuary deposits between many early Neolithic long barrows. Both the post holes at Husband Bosworth exhibited evidence of burning, suggesting they may have been deliberately set fire to. The post holes were replaced by another large pit that measured over three metres long and up to 60 centimetres deep. The pit contained an uncore stone lining that encircled, encircled its perimeter, forming a distinctive central subcircular void, sub, sorry, sub rectangular void. The silts within the void contain small quantities of Peterborough ware and a collection of flint that included an early Neolithic leaf shaped arrowhead. Excavation of the stone lining showed evident, clear evidence of collapse. Many of the cobbles were tilted towards the central void and the silts present between some of the stones indicated they had slumped from their original position. It is suggested that none of the stones within the base of the rectangular void were part of its original construction. The removal or decay of a central structure is the only logical explanation for the presence of the central void and the character of the collapsed lining. Although nothing has survived, the distinctive linear shape of the void strongly implies that a rectangular chamber was contained within the central area of the pit, presumably constructed of timber planks. Although the general shape of the chamber can be implied from the remaining void, its original size is less certain as it has been difficult to differentiate between the elements of the lining that remain in situ and those that formed its collapse. The lower stones at the two ends of the pit were more concentrated, suggesting they were still in situ. This could indicate the chamber was originally between 2.4 and 2.8 metres long and between 1 and 1.4 metres wide. The uncoursed nature of the stone lining suggests that it was constructed after the chamber was in place, infilling the space around the edge of the pit. This presumably would have provided structural integrity to the planks located along the longitudinal sides of the pit by holding them against shorter planks located at its ends. The quantity of stone that's collapsed down the sides and into the base of the pit suggests the stones may have originally extended above the ground level, framing the timber chamber it enclosed. There was no evidence to suggest the floor of the chamber was also lined with timber, although it seems likely. No deposits or finds were recorded on the base of the pit, although a small area of charcoal has provided material for radiocarbon dating. Again, the final phase of the fe feature is clearly reminiscent of other mortuary structures, although I have not come across a direct parallel so far for this one. Reconstructions shown here are both contain comparable elements, perhaps suggesting a level of complexity somewhere between the two. Mortuary structures exhibiting complex development histories are often finally covered by mounds or cairns. However, there was no evidence to suggest this happened at Husband's Bosworth, where the structure appears to have clapped and become silted over. Later evidence of mortuary activity was recorded some 200 metres southwest of the causeway enclosure, consisted of an isolated early Bronze Age burial. The grave was said subrectangular in plan, measuring 2.7 metres long and 1.7 metres deep. The sides of the grave were almost vertical, containing a ledge two thirds of the way down. The burial was located directly on the base of the grave. From the surviving remains, it is possible to suggest the individual had been placed on its left side in a semi-crouched position. The arms had been folded in, the left hand placed towards the chest area, and the right hand placed against the face. The poor bone survival has meant only minimal analysis was possible, which has suggested the skeleton was likely to have belonged to a male aged between 26 and 35. The burial has been radiocarbon dated to between 2140 and 2010 BC. The grave had been furnished with a toolkit of five flints that were tightly clustered near the feet of the burial, perhaps suggesting that they were originally contained within a bag. They included a flint lighter, three knives and a tertiary flake. A pig foreleg had also been placed near the left wrist, presumably forming a food offering. A burnt plank was recorded vertically along the northern side of the grave. The location of the plank corresponded with a band of loose gravel on the side of the grave. It suggests the plank may have been used to prevent the ingress of gravel into the grave. 
On the northern edge of the causewell enclosure, two more deep pits were recorded, although these didn't contain any evidence of burials. Both features were well over two metres deep with almost vertical sides. It meant they had to be ex excavated in two parts with the help of a machine bucket in order to reach their bases. The finds from these features consisted of single sherds of early and middle Neolithic pottery and a few undiagnostic flints. The pits themselves have been deliberately backfilled. Similar features interpreted as shafts have been found elsewhere in southern England, often in the vicinity of other monuments. Within the ceremonial complex of Binham Loop in Bedfordshire, nine such features were recorded. Here, the shafts were located on the periphery of the monument clusters. Four closely grouped shafts were dated the early Bronze Age, while a separate shaft produced an early Neolithic date. Although the finds assemblage from these ones were equally poor, they contained unusual animal bone deposits with high prevalence of wild species. It's been suggested that the pits were dug, used for offerings and deliberately backfilled as a part of ceremonial events being undertaken in and around the monuments there. Looking briefly at the non-monumental evidence from Husbands Bosworth, the evidence of activity contemporary of the Causewell enclosure was extremely rare. The evidence generally consisted of isolated pits containing small quantities of pottery and flint, spanning the early Neolithic to the Bronze Age periods. However, a notable cluster of pits was located 150 metres northwest of the Causewell enclosure. Two of these pits were of particular interest, which each containing large saddle querns, here's one Martin holding one there, pottery and a small quantity of charred food waste. We are waiting radiocarbon dates on these features, but again, we presume they're going to range between the early and Neolithic, middle Neolithic periods. Finally, I want to briefly talk about the wider con landscape context of the principal monuments excavated. We've already seen that the ring ditch, the mortuary structure and the causeway enclosure are spatially linked. If we look at this from a wider angle, we can clearly identify a linear arrangement extends across from the causewell enclosure that also intersects with a group of cremation burials and the early Bronze Age burial. It seems like the monuments are demarcating an otherwise invisible routeway leading to the causewell enclosure. Looking at the wider landscape and topography, not only is the causewell enclosure clearly tilted towards the River Avon, but also we can see that the linear arrangement correlates with the nearest part of the river to the monument. This seems unlikely to be coincidental. The river would almost certainly have been navigable in the Neolithic period and may represent the main method of travel to the causeway enclosure. So it's possible we've identified the potential landing point. Looking at the topography of the routeway itself, it would have provided a gentle gradient, making it easy to ferry goods between the river and the monument. I'm going to leave it there for now. As I said at the start, the analysis is still ongoing and should be completed by the end of the summer. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay. So uh, the small village of North Kilworth uh, is in the harbour district of South Leicestershire. It's about um, two and a half kilometres northwest from the Hus Husband's Bosworth site. Uh, the village is likely to have Anglo-Saxon origins and is recorded in the Doomsday Book as, as being Kivel's word. Uh, which means a settlement associated with the people of Kiffel, uh, which is a, a male, a man's name. Uh, the site is located at the corner of Station Road and Pinsett Lane on the northern edge of the village. Uh, Gelson Homes proposed to build up to 20 houses and they first commissioned a desk-based assessment to assess the archaeological potential. The desk-based assessment concluded that whilst the village was medieval, the activity was unlikely to extend into the uh, into the development area. There was no recorded Roman activity within a kilometre of the site. However, some prehistoric activity had been found nearby. In 2017, a small excavation was performed immediately to the west of the site, and this had evidence of a mid to late Iron Age settlement. In addition to this, uh, an early Bronze Age pit was found containing pottery uh, from collared urns, and these vessels are often associated with Bronze Age cremation burials, although it was uncertain if these were used domestically. A further away from the site, a Neolithic burial and a possible barrow have also been found at about a kilometre away. Six trenches were excavated across the area to investigate the archaeological potential. 
the first trench in the southeastern corner, mainly found furrows and plough scars. There were a couple of possible post holes and a shallow gully, but uh, it wasn't clear whether these were naturally formed. No other features were found, but we did get medieval pottery in the topsoil and uh, work flint in the subsoil. In the second trench in the southwestern corner contained two ditches. The central one was undated and the ditch at the western end uh, was post-medieval, which is uh, highlighted in blue. The archaeology was disturbed in this trench due to ploughs turning at the end of the field. Uh, the third trench was located centrally and contained the most amount of archaeology. Uh, the central and eastern area of the trench contained gullies, ditches and pits. These are all highlighted in red. These contained fragments of mid to late Iron Age pottery and flint. And several of them were dug into what appeared to be quite a wide layer, which occupied most of the eastern end of the trench. And again, a post-medieval ditch was also found uh, at the western end. And the archaeology appeared to decrease to the north, where we've just uh, one Iron Age ditch being found in the centre of Trench 4. A work flint was found in a shallow feature at the eastern end, but we weren't certain whether this was the base of a furrow. Again, we had the same post-medieval ditch found at the western end of the trench, but this time it was accompanied by a modern pit. And no archaeology was found in the other trenches. Trench 5 just contained a few naturally formed features, and Trench 6 uh, just had some furrows. The post-medieval ditches uh, were thought to be the same feature since a bank was visible uh, in the field next to them. Since no archaeology was found in Trench 6 in the northeastern, uh, in the northeastern corner, um, sorry, hang on, um, an area was agreed to be stripped around the surrounding trenches, which is highlighted in blue. Um, since no archaeology was found in Trench 6 in the northeastern corner, uh, this area was left unexcavated. The northwestern corner was a contingency area, and this could be investigated if features in, extended into it. We thought that the focus of the activity was in the centre of the site, which was highlighted in red. We suspected there was a roundhouse uh, with a few Iron Age ditches extending to the north and the south, and we didn't realise just how much archaeology was present there until we stripped the area. Now, the central area did contain the most amount of archaeology, However, far from there being an occasional ditch extending to the north and the south, a large swathe of archaeology covered this part of the site. From the trenching, we thought that we might have a roundhouse in the centre, but after we stripped it, we found we had three. So, yeah, uh, we thought there was a layer in the centre of the site uh, with features dug into the top of it, but the excavation found they were actually dug into the top of a huge ring ditch. Uh, we had another slightly smaller one in the centre of it too. Uh, the archaeology even extended into the contingency area in the northwestern corner. And in this area, we realised that we were slightly unlucky during the trenching, since we excavated a trench parallel to a large prehistoric ditch and found nothing in it. The archaeology decreased as it approached Trench 6, uh, and natural features were mostly found in the, uh, in the southeastern corner. A ditch was revealed in this area, however, it was agreed that we would focus on the western side of the site, uh, the excavation revealed archaeology ranging from the middle of the Neolithic uh, to the modern period. Uh, we had a single Mesolithic flint found, uh, and whilst there are hints of earlier activity, no features were dated earlier than the Neolithic. Uh, the largest features on the site were dated to the early Bronze Age. However, most of the activity occurred during the Iron Age and early Roman periods. Uh, Post-medieval and modern features were also present, and the site can be broken down into these four phases of activity. The earliest features were dated to the Middle Neolithic and were all in the northern part of the site. Most of the artefacts from this period were recovered from a layer and the excavation of it produced 49 sherds of pottery and 11 fragments of, of work flint, which is uh, this barn here. Several of the pottery sherds had a distinctive impressed decoration and appeared to be piece of aware bowls dated 3500 to 2900 BC. Most of the flint was debitage and the layer appeared to be the remains of a midden. Two small irregular gullies uh, there, and uh, post holes were also found beneath the layer and a later structure was dug into the top of it. Tree throws were found to the north of the midden and nearby several pits also contained Neolithic pottery and flints. The one of them had irregular undercutting edges and was filled with charcoal and burnt cobbles. Now it's possible um, this is a tree throw that has had burnt material dumped into it. A close by, a hearth was found, and this may be the source of the, the burnt material. 
this is in the picture, the hearth, which are circles, um, contained burnt stones and a flint chip, and was surrounded on its northern side by a small curving gully, which is highlighted there. Um, the gully had a parasol at the end of it and could be structural. It could be the remains of a, a small windbreak or a wall to reflect the heat. Uh, we had a layer of cobbles also found between the two features. This could be a patchy remains of a surface. The only other features that may be from the Neolithic period were several pits located close to the northern edge of the site. Um, these pits could only be dated through a few fragments of work flint. Um, so it's, it's possible that they, they could be from later activity as well. The early Bronze Age is when the largest and most prominent features were formed on the site. The activity during this period is when the two large ring ditches were created in the south and uh, a large ditch was found along the western edge. Uh, these are all highlighted in yellow on the plan. Uh, we'll start with the large ditch first and then we we'll move on to the ring ditches. Uh, this ditch measured more than two and a half metres wide and ranged from one and a half to 2.2 metres deep, becoming increasingly deeper to the north. The, norm the northernmost slot had to be machine excavated and it took five archaeologists to clean and record it. Uh, the ditch was very steep sided with a narrow base, as you can see from the section drawings. It contained no artefacts other than a piece of work flint. And there was nothing to radio carbon date. And in fact, dating all the features during this phase of activity has been difficult. Now, both the ditch and the, the ring ditches appear to be respecting each other. So they're probably broadly contemporary. Uh, we're just not sure which came first. Uh, the ditch is hard to interpret because we're only seeing a small section of it within the site, but it could be an early Bronze Age boundary. The ring ditches were found close to the southern side of the site, and the large outer ring ditch had an external diameter of 43 metres. No entrance was found into the ring ditch, this ring ditch, although the, southern we uh, the southwestern corner extended beyond the edge of the excavation. Like the boundary ditch to the west, this feature was big, and measuring three and a half metres wide and up to 2.2 metres deep. And due to the size, we employed several methods to excavate it. We hand dug three slots. We machined uh, the upper layers from four slots and hand dug the lower deposits. And we entirely machined another three. We found no artefacts when we were hand digging the, the deposits, although after the machining, we found this nice flint overhead. The sections through the ditch um, showed that the layers could be grouped into two general phases. The lower part of the ditch was filled with naturally occurring silts and layers formed from the erosion of the edges. Uh, in contrast, the upper half of the ditch was filled with a, a different sequence of deposits, and this was often characterised by darker colour layers or layers containing concentrations of stones, and that's uh, above the line. Uh, when we were excavating the ditch, we interpreted the upper part to be a later recut, but this might not be the case, and the change in deposits that we found may be shown that the ditch has moved from a period of natural silting to a period of, of rapid infilling. Iron Age pottery was found in the upper layers, and it seems likely that the ditch was deliberately infilled during this period. The inner ring ditch had a diameter of 20 metres and had an 8 metre gap left between it and the outer ring ditch. This ditch was only half a metre to a metre wide, but had steep or vertical sides, and was surprisingly deep, up to a metre in places. The inner ring ditch did not form a complete loop, which I highlighted here, and a one metre wide entrance was left in the southeastern edge. In several places, circular impressions measuring about half a metre wide were found in the base of the ditch, and these appear to be post holes. So there's a, there's a picture of it, there's the, the ditch and there's the, the post holes. In one slot, the post holes were spaced about uh, 20 centimetres apart, and the ditch appeared to be structural. It's probably a palisaded enclosure. The two large post holes were found blocking the entranceway, implying that access within the enclosure had at some point been removed. And this is the, the picture that we have in the, the, the bottom corner here. The, uh, the, the ditch is highlighted in red, um, and uh, here the, the post holes are blocking the entranceway. Uh, during a later phase, the ring ditch has been recut with a shallow ditch, um, which truncated all of the post holes, although it wasn't clear whether this uh, formed a complete loop or not. The dating the palisade was problematic since the feature had been disturbed by later ploughing and there was even a tree throw in the top, the, the top edge. Iron Age pottery was found in the top of the recut and another shirt was found a bit deeper in the ditch. We also found some charred plant remains, but when we had them radiocarbon dated, they came back as being medieval. And these remains are probably all later contamination 
and the trench um, we excavated in this area recorded a lot of modern disturbance. And despite the problems with dating, the Palisade Trench may actually be the earliest part of the ring ditches. And in the centre we had a, a crouch burial. The crouch burial was very poorly preserved. Uh, the bone had completely mineralised or appeared as a stain in the soil. In general, bone was very poorly preserved on the site and the majority of remains found throughout the entire excavation amounted to a few teeth or the occasional animal bone in the top of a ditch. Now, because of this, the burial couldn't be carbon dated, but enough to uh, enough survived to understand that it was in the crouched position. Uh, it, it was also possible to see that the body had been positioned with the head towards the entrance. If you see, a, see there, um, orientating the burial in this way, it may have been a deliberate action and beyond the entrance on the same alignment as a, as a large post hole. Uh, this is one of several post holes found around the southern and northern sides of the enclosure, which could be structural or acting as marker posts. The crouch burial was truncated on its northern edge by a shallow feature, and although no bones survived, its size and shape could be a grave of a, a baby or an infant. The two vessels were found within the feature, as we can see in the, the close-up photo. The largest of the two was found inverted and was either a beaker or a food vessel. It had 10 rows of twisted cord decoration on the outside, two rows of dots, and the twisted cord decoration was also found on the inside of the rim. Uh, the second vessel was a partially complete bowl, and this had a small stub for, uh, of the handle where the handle had broken off. It was covered with a herringbone design, um, which was formed from rows of oblique stab marks. Charred hazelnut shells were found within the feature, and we attempted to radiocarbon date them to help date the vessels, but again the datum was a little help and we found the plant remains to be residual. And this time, instead of having a date of medieval and being thousands of years later than we expected, the hazelnut shell dated to 7000 BC and was thousands of years earlier than we expected. To the northeast, uh, another, uh, another vessel was found in the, the base of a feature, which is uh, just there. Again, no bone accompanied it, although the feature could be another grave. Uh, the vessel was lying on its side and had been pushed flat by the overlaying deposits. Uh, it was decorated with several lines of stab decoration. Charred hazelnut shells were found within the feature and these were radiocarbon dated to 2800 to 2500 BC. But again, we're not certain if these are residual or not. All three vessels recovered from within the palisaded enclosure, which were a very nice drawing up here, uh, were difficult to date and shared similarities with beakers and food vessels. And because of this, it's thought that they are transitional and they date from the, the latter part of the beaker tradition um, and um, the beginning of the food vessel tradition at around 2200 to 1800 BC. And several more possible graves were found within the, the enclosure. These are highlighted blue, although no bone or, or vessels were found within them. The only other features within the enclosure were post holes and they were found in a similar location to the possible graves. The ring ditches and the features within them displayed several phases of activity and it seems likely that the earliest phase was the palisaded enclosure and the crouch burial which can be seen in the corner of the screen. Over time other uh, graves or offerings have been added along with post holes on the inside and around the outer edges. The entrance to the enclosure has been blocked and since the access was no longer required this is probably the point that it was encircled by the large outer ditch which is the, the plan we can see in the, the opposite corner. The excavated material from the outer ditch was probably piled over the central, the central area to form a mound and evidence for this can be seen with the arrangement of the later Iron Age features around the monument. And if we bring in the, the plan and we add the Iron Age and the early Roman features which are highlighted in, in blue, you'll notice that all the activity is around the outside and some of the features such as the, uh, the, the round houses and the, the enclosure ditches they, they truncate the outer ditch, but they all avoid the central area, and this is probably because it was protected by a mound. A curving gully uh, has even been added between the, the inner ring ditch and the roundhouses, and uh, this appears to be forming a barrier, uh, a boundary between the Iron Age activity and the earlier Bronze Age features. Because the palisaded enclosure has been surrounded with a large outer ditch and the material has been used to create a mound, the monuments are round barrow. 
And there are different types of barrows uh, and the curving gully and the, the location of the round houses suggest the mound and the outer ditch were probably separated by a gap or a berm. And because of this, uh, the North Kilworth Monument could be referred to as being a bell barrow. The top of the outer, uh, the top of the outer ring ditch was unfilled during the Iron Age period. And this appears to be a deliberate attempt to level the area. Two out of the three round houses found on the site were dug into the top of the outer ring ditch, suggesting that by the time they were constructed during the late Iron Age, all evidence of this ditch had been removed from the landscape. The round houses are highlighted by the curving drainage ditch, which are uh, marked there, and these surround the outside of the structure. All of the round houses at North Kilworth were post built structures and did not survive very well. A gap uh, in the ditches has been left in the eastern edge and this marks the location of the entrances. Two large saddle crones were found within the round houses, which are these, these pictures. And these were uh, unusually large for Iron Age um, saddle crones. And uh, the crone in the bottom right hand corner appears to have been modified with two holes and reused as a, as a rotary crone. Um, both these crone stones resemble uh, earlier Neolithic or, or Bronze Age objects, and they appear to have been reused by the the, uh, the later Iron Age occupants of the site. All the round houses had evidence for food consumption and crop processing. Cereal grains, including barley, emma, and spelt wheat, were found in the features, along with slow stones and hazelnut shells. The preservation of the animal bone was poor and mostly consisted of a few teeth. But despite this, it was possible to identify horse and cattle, sheep, or, uh, or, sheep or goat uh, in the Iron Age features. All of the round houses were being used or, or modified in the early Roman period. The entrance to one round house was removed and changed to the opposite side of the C-shaped ditch, which is the, the picture in the top right hand corner. Another round house has a ditch added to the side of this uh, on the left hand side. And this appears to be curving around the outside of the structure. Uh, one of the round houses in the bottom of the screen was the most complicated and the ditch surrounding the outside of it was accompanied by several smaller gullies. And these gullies were found on both the, the inside of the roundhouse and on around the outer edges. And they appear to be repeated attempts to, to drain standing water away from the structure. There were parts of Iron Age enclosures visible to the south of the site, although these extended beyond the excavation. And to the north, there was a large rectangular shaped enclosure that butted up to the edge of, uh, of the roundhouse. So there, there's the roundhouse in the bottom of the screen. And there's the, uh, the ditch. Ooh, I've gone too far. Um, the enclosure was mostly filled with pits and post holes. Uh, in the north of the enclosure, one group of four post holes may represent a, a small structure. In the southeastern corner, a rectangular structure was also found, uh, which was dug into the, the Neolithic midden, which is the, the structure we can see in the photos. The structure resembled a, a Neolithic structure and contained Neolithic pottery, but as we excavated, we found uh, uh, very early Roman pottery in the assemblage and we concluded that it's probably a later structure and the earlier artifacts were residual. Each side of the structure was formed from th uh, a row of three oval shaped depressions which are perhaps seen in the plan. And uh, these may have been caused by logs being sunk into the ground to provide a base for a wall. Within the structure and around the edges were post holes and it's possible these were used to raise the floor. The structure could be something um, like an early Roman granary. Uh, an early Roman ditch was located to the south of the structure, which is uh, marked on the farm there. And it's unclear whether this formed the southern edge of the rectangular enclosure. It's in the right location to be one side, but uh, this ditch truncates the top of the roundhouse, whereas the other ditch uh, butts up to it and is respecting it. And it's possible that uh, this is a, an Iron Age enclosure uh, which is still being used after the roundhouse has gone and the later ditch is just a modification to it. Accompanying all the prehistoric activity, there was a, a post-medieval trackway leading into the village, a ditch forming the eastern edge of the trackway, which is just uh, there, was found, uh, with patches of stone surface being occasionally found next to it. The line of the trackway is, is highlighted by a row of uh, quarry pits that have been dug uh, to remove the stone surface after it's finished. And some of these were quite large. Um, they may have realised that the, the natural ground was full of sand and gravel 
once they'd remove the surface and uh, continue quarrying it. Uh, the ditch contained 17th to 18th century pottery, and the quarry pits contained um, 18th to 19th century pottery. A hearth was found in the, the southern end of the trackway, um, and this can be seen in the bottom corner. Uh, the heat turned the surrounding ground a, a bright red colour, and a layer of charcoal was found next to it. And in this, in this area, we had evidence of iron working in the trackway ditch, and this was probably from the hearth. Uh, like the earlier Roman and Iron Age features, the trackway also misses the centre of the ring ditches, and it's possible there was still a small earthwork in the field when it was constructed. And, and this concludes the talk, um, ring ditches and roundhouses and other prehistoric activity at North Kilworth. Uh, the site is of local and regional significance and has expanded knowledge on the prehistoric activity of the area. Although there are hints of early activity in the Mesolithic period, uh, the first evidence of occupation is dated to the middle of the Neolithic. Uh, the largest features were formed during the early Bronze Age when the large boundary ditch and the uh, 43 metre wide bell barrow was formed. Uh, but the majority of archaeology relates to the, the Iron Age and the early Roman settlement that spreads around the outside of the monument. Uh, and in fact, the excavation of the site shows how you can use Iron Age roundhouses to learn about Bronze Age ring ditches. Thank you.